Homage to him, the Holy One, the fully enlightened one, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. There we go. Now, uh, I don't get to see some of you, you know, in person. It's really hard when you don't get to see some people in person. Uh, because what we're going to look at is, do you think you're learning anything here? You all need to tell me, do you think you're learning anything here? Come on, you can speak up, turn your mics off and, and uh, say, are, are you learning here? Of are course. You, are you definitely. learning? You yeah, learning definitely. New things, new things. Part is I want to show you how much you're actually learning. That's part of what I want to do tonight before I go down to Las Nagar. I'm going to go on Friday. I'm packing now. Tomorrow they will come and show up and put the packing in the car. In the, and then we will drive on Friday morning. We will drive and we will drive and we will drive <laughs> because that's India. <laughs> that's why we call it that way. So um, the first thing, do you know what the five aggregates are? You yes. know, you can speak up. Okay, so who wants to tell me what the five aggregates are? Ravi, do you know what the five aggregates are? Yeah? Hmm? Oh boy, this is bad. <laughs> okay, so I know I taught you the five aggregates. Yes, yes, Mataji, sorry, I was on a mute actually. Okay. So should so I say what the five aggregates are? Yeah, so tell me what the five aggregates are. So it is Rupa, body. It is vinyana that is consciousness. It is sanya that is perception. Uh, it is the sankhara that is uh, uh, that is. No, it is vedana that is uh, sensation, and then sankhara that is. Uh, so these are Good. the five. Areas. So we say body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. You have five aggregates. You all know the six sense doors. I wish the Sunday school class was here. Dr. Kwa, they would tell me the six sense doors. <laughs> Simple eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind. And these, these things, they are in relationship, I know you guys mostly know this, but to the forms we see and the sounds we hear, the odors we experience, with the nose and the flavors with the tongue and then the sensations with the body and that's the outward experience exterior external experience internal experience is mind and what do we tell you the mind is the command center the command center and um then we taught you basically um three kinds of feeling there are many kinds. We can extend this between the bodily feeling, physical feeling, and mental feeling. Uh, but the easy way is to learn only what you need to know in order to get on the path and move along. This is what we're interested in. We want to teach you what operates that benefits you as the average person in the world to reduce suffering. I need to go backwards a little bit. I wanna go back to my other notes for a minute. I, um, I didn't have time to scribble a lot because I was hunting for the, for the glasses and the little people are now wearing glasses <laughs> running around. Okay, so when I was young, um, I used to watch a lot of movies in high school and theater arts and plays and learn about different Things And I, I didn't realize I was walking around hunting for the glasses and all of a sudden it crossed my mind. I did hear a story when I was young about Buddhism. I just didn't know it. <laughs> and uh, back when I was growing up, the, the big thing in Hollywood was the gladiators, you know, and the, about Rome and all that stuff. 
And there was a story that happened, and I don't remember the name of the movie, but I distinctly remember this because of Buddha, Buddha Dhamma. This movie was uh, trying to find an answer to everything in the world, the answer. And, um, and there was a king who found out there existed a book. There was a book and he was going to go and find this book. He had a family and he had lovely wife and children and elder family and he was really happy. And he started behaving differently in his kingdom and he started to hunt for this book. And then there was another king that found out he was hunting for something very, very, very precious. And the, nobody could tell him what was in the book. And really the first king, he didn't know what this was either. And what happened because of the nature of human beings is uh, they, they were hunting for it because they always talk, human beings always talk about finding the ultimate answer to peace and calm and, and living a happy life. They want to go find happiness. I'm going to give a talk on the um, uh, 17th of October on Zoom, a big talk that's about uh, the happiness, yeah? And pursuit of happiness. And how do you pursue happiness? And what's the, the way to get this happiness, you know? But anyway, he's hunting for the book and the other one starts a war against him because he thinks that he has it, but his intel is wrong, his intelligence is wrong. But in the process of that, they go to war and they're killing everybody, just killing everybody. Because in those days, it was kind of like Star Wars happened and they wrote a book about how many people were killed in the, in the story or the towering inferno movie where they wanted to know how many people were killed from the tower before it burned with Bruce Willis. Well, this was the same sort of thing, you know, they, they wanted, uh, they were just killing all these people and villages were being burned when the one king was going to fight with the other king and and then finally, in the end of the movie comes, you know, and he has lost his wife. The child has been killed. His parents were killed. The castle was burned, you know, to the ground. The other king is about wiped out. And the two of them are on a mountain and they fight to the death. Of, and they know that the book is on top of that mountain. And finally, uh, this person who was holding on to the book that's killed, but the book is there on a rock. And at the end, one of them, I don't even remember which one, is still alive. And he goes to the rock and he picks up uh, the book. And he's beautiful book, oh, handmade and carved and painted and just beautiful. And he opens only a few pages and it says, this is the book the answer and he always oh, got the and he goes this is the truth and then he turns the page and it says this is the answer to ultimate peace and calm and the way has always been right in front of you and there's an arrow on the page and you turn the page and there's only one more page he's this not a big book the man is very confused he turns the page and there's a mirror, <laughs> a mirror. And he looks at the mirror and at first he doesn't get it, you know? And the point is the answer has always been in front of all of us, but we have been so wrapped up with the craving and the clinging and the human drive, you know, to, have acquisition and to get there and to make it happen and to call it mine. And all of this has put us in a position, even when we hand you the answer, right in front of you is the answer and it does work and it does operate. And here we are, a group of people, we're small, we're very small. There's Bonte, there's me, there's David, um, and there are some teachers that have come up, uh, popped up and now we're going to try to help them to get beyond the first jhana, 
you know, we're going to try to get them to go further. But we know we can show you in a retreat face to face. But why can't you just go right down the path is because you desperately want to say, I made it happen. I can make this happen. And when I do do it, why do you lose it? If you do manage to go through one time, why do you lose it or stop? I did it. I have to tell everyone I did it, you see. And then this I jumps in your face. And is like a commando officer of, you know, uh, what's that doll called, G.I. Joe, standing there saying, I am here and I am going to try to go further. And then you want to make it happen again. And the funny part about this whole thing was that you don't have to do anything. You just have to look and see that the answer is right here inside your head. And all you had to do was be quiet and let go of everything, everything. There's so much that you have learned and yet people will come and go through whole retreats and say, but the thoughts are coming up, but the thoughts are raining down and you tell them what to do and they come back the next day and say, but the thoughts are coming up, the thoughts are raining down and it keeps going like that and they can't get past it. And all you can do is keep telling them the instructions and the answer the answer and we we give you the answer what are what are we really about at damasuka what was this that happened there is um you know uh with myself i can't speak from myself why do i stay in india because you're brilliant because you have such incredible minds that are eager to know what did the Buddha actually teach. With the Indians, it's a wonderful, marvelous experience. It's been so far away from the people for so long that if you tell a good story to a group of children with their parents and they're sitting there with the children, <laughs> I look at the children and I just, they're just right there watching everything I say. But the thing is, so are the parents. They're so excited what will happen next and they want to know the answer and then they want to try to carry it out and do something with it. I saw something in the last five years, I have seen something, five or six years, just be in Malaysia and here in India, okay? So it's been about five, six years. And what it has to do with is the discovery. You wanted reciprocity. Reciprocity comes from reciprocal. You wanted something reciprocal. You wanted something from the monastics because you may not have known what the Dhamma was, but you were in the process of wanting to find out you wanted something for the people. You see, if I tell you the whole point of Buddhism is the final super mundane Nibbana and the end of all suffering, and that's all I tell you. And then as you listen to the story, you find out, well, that happened when he went into Paranibbana when he died. And you think to yourself, well, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. <laughs> He must have found something. He must have found something uh, that told us something about cessation of suffering that people could use. And that's what fascinates me. It was a system originally of reciprocity. That means the monks were giving the people a practice to use. This is what I firmly, firmly believe giving the people something that they valued it so much. It was so precious what they found and knew how to teach you from the Buddha. That it helped them to relieve suffering in daily life. And anybody could do this. 
And this was not about a religion. In the beginning, there were no Buddhists to teach. And this was not something they were supposed to go out and recruit Buddhists, or that was not the thrust of this. The thrust of this was they were supposed to have this practice that was easy to understand. That's the clue. Here's the big clue. What are we hunting for? Something that was easy to understand. Something that was immediately effective. That means it immediately relieves suffering some in life. It was inviting deeper inspection. That means it was so interesting when you found out how to do it, you wanted to see more. And the more you studied, the more you learned there were degrees of relief, degrees of training. There were attainments for and for more as fruitions. These did not happen on top of each other. This is a breakdown in understanding. If it happened on top of each other, that the moment you got to be a Sotapanna, you are, were automatically in a few minutes, one seventeenth of a jawana moment, whatever that is, probably a nanosecond. <laughs> okay, in a nanosecond, you were also had your fruition. If that was true, then there were not eight kinds of people in the Buddhist camp. There were only four. Am I right? Of course. But we have the preservation that tells us there were eight kinds of people in the camp working toward the super mundane uh, Nibbana, the Sotapanna group, trying the people like you and me trying to become Sotapanna. Then once we become Sotapanna, that group's working together, talking to each other. You know what happened to me, Ulysses, when I was practicing and Ulysses says, you know, that happened to me at the same place you're talking about the same way. Wow, that must be the way it works because it happened to Bhante Dhamma Gavesi and I heard it happened to Deepa too. Wow, that's, oh wow, now we're a lot more confident we're on the right track, you see? But today what happened? <laughs> Do not ever talk to anyone about your practice. We hear this all the time. If you don't, how will you know what is going on generally? How will you know? Do, will you, I know people who quit after 50, 40 or 50 years of practice in California. And I don't think they ever met anyone that, that they could really talk to like during, you know, to get more confident to go ahead like that. So this is part of what we don't have today. This is very hard because we're so small, we need people who want to have a house, and this is hard with COVID, but we thought people, want, people were starting to volunteer. I want to open my house for meditation once a week, uh, you know, or I would like to mentor a couple people. Can you show me how to help just one or two people to see if I could share this with somebody? How could I help them get started? Yeah, or I want to teach. Okay, you want to teach, it's going to take some time. It isn't about having a degree or going to college or being a master's degree or PhD either. It doesn't have anything to do with that. It has to do with being, this, being sensitive and being able to sense what's going on in people as you're teaching them, but you cannot guide them if you haven't done it yourself. And you cannot instruct them about this unless they're at least stable in the fourth jhana and they, then they can uh, talk a person through that part. In the time of the Buddha, they had Sariputta and Moggallana running the school. And Sariputta was the mother who took the person in to the monastics and taught them to the fourth jhana. Then when they reached the fourth jhana, they would go on to Moggallana. He would guide them from there. And he was the nurse. Nurses stop by, give you your medication, and they go away. They don't do your temp. They take your temperature. They go away. They visit all the people. You see, the mother is with you all the time, every day. You see, so it's difficult because you have to be able to guide that person then 
through infinite space, infinite consciousness, neither nothingness, and help them through neither perception or non-perception. You can help them, but you're not with them all the time. People don't realize uh, how long it took me to start doing this, you know. I started teaching in 2009, but then I came back with my tail between my legs and said, I need at least two or three years just watching you do interviews to Bunty because I knew what happened to me and I knew I could teach one or two people, but it was terrifying to suddenly have 35 brains in front of me and think about what was going on for each person and keep track of it and try to guide them because they were going at different paces and you're all doing different things at different paces, which is normal. But it takes a long time to be able to hear if this happens, this is solution. If this happens, this is solution. And it's not locked in stone in almost any situation, meaning it, there could be a variance here and a variance there, et cetera, and so forth. So it takes time. And we're trying to work out a way to coach um, those who want to teach or who are attempting to teach but are not that successful. And you know, when I heard some of the, uh, the way it was happening for some of the teachers, I was a little, wow, I, we really need to do this now. We really need to have a coach in place just for the teachers because they, we need to be sharing a lot more. But the thing about us, about Damasuka, is it wants to take it back to the people. It doesn't want anyone to ever believe that it's just confined to monastics that they are the ones that can make these attainments and no one else can. We constantly get uh, letters from all angles, all of us, about um, does a person have to isolate themselves to become a sotapanna? No. Or a sakadagami? No. Can they still stay at home and work and have a job if they're an anagami? Yes. But you need to hear a lot more about that, but this is not what tonight is about. Okay, so when you come to us, the difficulty is usually you have to unlock your mind. So what do I mean? I don't mean give up your point of view. I don't mean um, lose out on anything that you have done anywhere else. That is not what I mean, okay? What I'm talking about is pretending that your, your um, that your mind is like a, a window with a number of panes in it, different panes. You know, if you had a window with one, two, three, four pieces of glass, if you could just in your mind, when you come to practice TWIM, have one glass, take it out and take whatever we say in and try it out without any of these other things disturbed or being used and let them go. Our job was simply to help you catch when you fall off into one of those habits that were there from before or one of the trainings you had before. Because as easy as this little thing is, just like the Buddha said, the problem with it is following the instructions perfectly. And I've read this to you before, but this thing about you have to be with me to, um, to really understand this is the vast difference that happens between five or 20 people. What is it? It's enough to cause you bewilderment, vacha, enough to cause you confusion. The Dhamma is profound and hard to see and hard to understand. It is peaceful and sublime, attainable, unattainable by mere reasoning, meaning reading or just thinking yourself, subtle to be experienced by the wise, the person who can watch dependent origination, who understands dependent origination, who can put it together with what's happening in their own life and start watching it in other people's lives. When they say wise, that's what it means. It is hard for you to understand when you hold another view, accept another teaching, approve of another teaching, pursue a different training, and follow a different teacher. 
it won't happen. And so then he pulls the person around to shh, just listen to what I say, just follow what I'm asking you to do, then see what happens, whether it works or not. So over the years, we always have the thing where someone will come and say, you know, this just doesn't work. And when you question them, they're not doing it. They're not doing the six R's properly. They're cheating <laughs> and they don't mean to, it's out of habit. It's not their fault, but they don't see their habit. See, when you become a seminary or a seminara as a monk, the teacher's job, you're supposed to be staying with that teacher for about five years in the beginning. And the reason that the monk stays by the teacher is because they know the person and they come as a samanera for two years and then they take a higher ordination, but they're supposed to stay in contact with the system they came through to be ordained because if they're playing it correctly, if both parties are playing it correctly, the monk is supposed to be testing that young samanera or older samanera and showing that person where their shadow is when they can't see it. That's what we call it. I call it the shadow watching. When I was a samanera and I traveled as a, a transporter person for Bhante, no matter where I was in a restaurant, in a store, in a parking lot, pumping gas or, or anything I was doing, if something was wrong, he, he could tell me what was wrong. I would never take offense. He could correct me because I was walking wrong. I did something too fast. I spoke too fast. I didn't, the favorite one is fix your robe. Please straighten up your robe. <laughs> your robe is crooked. Your robe is too high. Your robe is too low. For years, you know. But you never take offense. And if you're doing something that he can see is wrong, that is craving, he'll show it to you. But we don't have a lot of this happening anymore. We have people running around, going to Bodh Gaya, paying $75, getting robes in a bowl and getting a higher ordination and coming out and saying, I'm a monk, boom, no teacher. They come back to India or they come, if they go to Thailand to do that and they come back into India, they come into what I call an empty bowl. They did it on their own. They have no guidance. There's no teacher. So then I asked eight or 10 different monks in different places in India, how did you train? What did you learn? Where did you get it? Oh, I studied with this. I studied this book. I studied that book. I did this. I did that. There's no, there's continuity. It's like very questionable. But the biggest thing we want you to try to see and try to understand is come and ask us questions, write us questions and let us answer you back. And uh, then you can do what you want with it. Um, because the purpose for us is to reclaim an approach to relieving suffering composed of retuning definitions for familiar terminology. You've already heard it, but if it's a little bit off, then it doesn't work. Just like a part in a car. You know, I asked somebody today uh, about his car. He has a Lexus. <laughs> and I said, well, if your car breaks, it doesn't run the right way, what do you do? You go and fix it, he said. So you go to the neighborhood garage. Yeah, but if he can't fix it, what do you do? Do you go to the uh, dealership? He said, yeah, because they have a bigger book of what's the car about, see? Well, what do you do if it doesn't work when you go to the dealership? I go back to the factory, he said, because they have the book that created the car and they're going to be able to fix it and tell you why it isn't working. We can't go back to the Buddha, but how, how close can we get if our practice isn't working? We can go back to the text. That's what we try to do. That's why we're doing it. So a lot of the terminology you hear, of course, you've heard it before with other practices. But if it wasn't quite right, like listen to how Bhante teaches Satipatthana, and I'm always amazed, you know, he's just retuning, retuning, retuning a few things in it. He's not taking it away. He's not saying um, that uh, 
anything that she learned in Satipatthana was really wrong, but he's retuning why you're doing something or who should be doing something like the cemetery contemplation is not for lay people. Maybe somebody who's in their 80s or 90s. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but it's not for lay people with families and children. It's just not for them. And yet we have people all over the place who want to teach the cemetery contemplation to lay people. And they don't explain enough about what it's for. Just the body contemplation is different. You'll see that in the Satipatthana. It's the, 30, the 32 parts of the body, I think it is. And when you, there's a reason for teaching that to somebody who's very lustful. And you teach a lay person, I've taught a man about that, and all of a sudden, ah, oh, he calms down. Ah, oh, his relationship calms down. Oh, everything is better. And we can go out and he's enjoyable, and now he knows what to do if he sees Marilyn Monroe come by. <laughs> he knows what to do. He turns her wrong side out and looks at her, and then he's not going to get his wife crazy or anybody else that he's with because he's turned her wrong side out. And now his lust goes, wow, look at those intestines. <laughs> look at that stomach. Wow. Maybe we could share a little bit of fluids. Ugh. <laughs> no. So, I mean, you see, that's okay. But the cemetery contemplation, think about it. Read it sometime if you have to, but don't take it seriously. You, you take it for what it is. And if you haven't gotten to the point where you can just take it for what it is, you shouldn't do it. Um, let's see. We return the definitions to familiar terminology in language you can explain, you can understand, and you can explain to someone else for a particular purpose, because we're trying to refine the operation of a daily form of relief from suffering. We're trying to give you something you can use all the time. You know, people don't believe me. And I look, I, there are people in your room right now <laughs> who in 10 days decided to turn their whole life upside down and change their point of view, their relationships with their parents, with their husbands, with their children, and with the people at work. And they're totally different people. And they're laughing. And they see what is essential. And they let go of what is unessential. And they bring balance into their understanding. And no matter what road they drive down, it's going to be smoother because they can accept what's happening at the present time and then go on from there. And why could they just go on from there? Even if it was something horrible that happened, you know, you got home and the, the house blew up, somebody left the gas on and it's just gone. There was a spark and it's just gone. I saw that once when I was growing up. Well, those people ended up in the hospital with mental breakdowns, but Actually, that was a situation of a Nietzsche, wasn't it? And it was a harsh example of a Nietzsche. And you have very hard things you go through in life that are examples of a Nietzsche. When you change the definitions, what are you touching? You're touching mindfulness. You're changing meditation's definition. You're changing the purpose of the object in a meditation practice. You are changing your attitude about a hindrance when it comes up. You are changing the way you're going to manage the hindrance or not manage it, not pay attention to it. You, you change what you understand about equanimity. You change to a different um, idea about the different attainments because we go to the why, why? Because the first place we go to look to see what they meant is what the Buddhists said. Okay, and if you, you know, you really want to understand why we're doing this, you go to the Digha Nikaya, and the Digha Nikaya in Sutta number 16, the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, and go to section 4.8 and read what it says. Suppose that a monk were to say, friends, I heard and I received this from the Lord's own lips. 
And this is the Dhamma, this is the discipline, this is the master's teacher, teaching, his teaching. And then the monks, you should neither approve nor disapprove of his words. So you students, you hear somebody talk, you shouldn't approve of it or disapprove of it. His words and expressions, just listen, be polite. But should, should, you should carefully note and compare what he said or she said with the suttas and review it in the light of the discipline. And if they, on such comparison and review, are found not to conform with the suttas or the discipline, the conclusion must be, assuredly, this is not the word of the Buddha. It has been wrongly understood by this teacher. And the matter is to be rejected. But when on such comparison and review, it is found to conform to the suttas or the discipline, the conclusion must assuredly be that it is the word of the Buddha and it has been rightly understood by you. And this is the first thing that you look at when you are, um, when you're examining how you're listening to something be taught, how you're reading a book. What happens to our students over the years is uh, they actually will say, you know, I got this book at the, at the bookshop and I read it and it was Adama. <laughs> Adama, no Dhamma. <laughs> One time I got a, a, a CD. We listened to it in the truck while we were driving across the country. You know, we listened to that three times and it was over an hour and a half long, but we could not find the Dhamma in the talk. And it was distressing. That makes you stop and think. So this is where when once you start using this and it's working right in your life and you see how people are asking you what are you doing where did you go what did you what did you find that you're smiling more that you're letting things go and the rest of it what did you do this is what it's about this is what we're doing now when you want to understand suffering and you want to understand the cause of it and you want to see say to yourself can i let go of that and then the question is how after that the part about what is the suffering what causes it can we you know can this be let go of well what causes it and is what's it like with the cessation of it those three noble truths go to 141 and 141 has a section in it that he did not forget to tell you in detail. This is interesting. Someone said it's a shame that he only gave us directions on breathing meditation and that's all he did. And I didn't know what to say to that person, but that I didn't realize what we had, what we were learning at that time. I didn't know how lucky we were. This person had been practicing for some 20 years and the only thing he had ever heard anything about was Anapanasati Sutta. No other text at all. It, to me, I couldn't understand simply because we were, we were swimming in text on the mountain every day. We were living in it all the time. Okay, in 141, um, Section 10 is where it begins. And he start to understand specifically what, I'm sorry, it was before that. Uh, start um, in section five, read from there. And every single piece that is mentioned in suffering, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair okay one paragraph for each one that's impressive it's impressive now when you get down to birth which is what this talk is partially about <laughs> we're talking about the link birth and when we're talking about it the argument that was happening back in we heard a lot about it 
in the early part from 2000 to 2010, is you can't teach the, the dependent origination that way because birth is just the birth of a human being. But if you say that to me, it's just that, and you can find it that way to that definition, you're not looking into this in a correct way. If you look on 141 and what friends is birth, the, now listen carefully, the birth of beings into the various orders of beings, they're coming to birth, precipitation in the womb, the generation, and then the manifestation of the aggregates obtaining the basis for contact. This is called birth. Now, there's nothing wrong with the front part of that. It's talking about the birth of a human being, but the end, the manifestation of aggregates themselves and your aggregates our body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness, and how your suffering actually works and operates in everything. If we look at this from another angle, is it true? Let's do it this way. Is it true that you have no thought and you are just listening to me now, but now you have a thought arise? Is that the birth of a thought? Yeah, birth of a thought, okay. And is that the existence of the thought? Yes, until I let go of it or just let it, you know, six, it's, it's gone. I'm here in the present time. Can you do that with a minute of time? Do you have the birth of a minute, the existence of it and the passing of it? Can you do it with a second? Can you do it with a fraction of a second, you see? Now, when you go through the whole text in the Majima Nikaya, it becomes obvious that what you are attempting to do, as described in 148, Chachaka Sutta, you are attempting to fully and completely understand the origination, the disappearance, and then the gratification, and then the danger and the escape of all phenomena that arise, whether they're pleasant, painful, or neither painful nor present, doesn't matter. You see, it's not just referring to the neither painful nor pleasant feeling. It's referring to, do you begin to understand how everything is operating with the arising of the phenomena, the situation? Now, when we're, when we are learning about a microscope in high school, in science class, they give you a small microscope. And they give you usually, it has three little things that turn, you know, for 100 times, 200 times, and like 300 times, I think it's usually three of them on the first microscope you ever get to use. And they do this, they get you to get, bring from home or something to class, some pond water. And you think it's just water in a pond and you look inside, oh, something's moving inside. I can see something moving. Then we put it on the second power, 200. And we see individual things in the water are moving. I don't want to drink this. <laughs> then, we can go to 300 or more powerful advanced to another microscope and see these little amoebas that are in there. We can see that they have actual systems inside them and they can split and become more than one. And now we get fascinated with science. Yeah, okay. What am I talking about? Okay. You don't go to the microscopic, smallest way of explaining something and expect someone to accept it, or the fastest moving one and expect them to be able to believe it's real. You bring a concept of movement and teach them first with just a few gears, how those gears move and work together, how they go like this when they turn and they go through and lock and turn you see like that like that see okay 
Later, you can show them a machine that is built that's faster. Later, you can put it into a plane or a truck or a car and make it work and you have a vehicle. Then we can put it into something bigger. What turns out to be the easiest way to learn dependent origination is to show you how it applies in a middle approach, not across lifetimes. And lifetimes is, is a very funny thing. Um, I was very angry that Buddha Gosa did this and he said three lifetimes with uh, dependent origination. Till one night I had a dream. And I thought to myself, what is the lifetime of one experience? What is the lifetime of one feeling coming up of disappointment and then being there and then falling away? Are those lifetimes too? And that was an interesting thing. I went back to the, um, to the city mug. I read the whole thing again, that part about that. And I, I read it in terms of in my mind, when something arises in my mind, it's there and it passes away. Is that a lifetime? So then if you read what he's saying, it makes sense. But people didn't interpret it that way. They took it and I think it was a human drive, personal drive, no matter what happened in Buddhism, a personal drive that we got involved in saying lifetimes, but it's not me. And we tried to do that in saying lifetime to lifetime to lifetime. I also ran into a woman in another religion and she, when I was presenting some things, was just very indignant that we would even consider this life, us going through this life, and just that's passing away from it, and then coming our, our uh, energy, comic energy, traveling into a universal uh, consciousness and coming out in another human being. And she went, what? What are you talking about? You mean my beauty, my beauty, my, my beauty is not going to go forever and ever and ever for eternal? She was really, really upset. And we tried to explain, I listened to a, a monk, tried to explain the difference between reincarnation and rebirth to that person and it was like talking to a stone because this was everything. This is everything. Without this, there is nothing. It's me, me, mine. And she was so completely enamored. It was a shock. And then he, she listened further and began to understand the theory behind it. But we have so many things mixed up today with trying so many directions of teaching Buddhism. We are challenging mindfulness, challenging meditation, challenging the object of meditation, challenging the hindrance attitude, challenging this, the process of living and just arising in birth and living through a life and then passing away, but our energy of what we have done in our actions affects another being in another lifetime, which could be a man. What? It's not me. <laughs> you see, it could end up being a man. There are people who have done past life regressions where that person was a man. Then they were a woman and a woman and then a man and a man and a man and a woman and a woman. Nobody knows why. Then there are people who have been woman, 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 and men who have been men, 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 men. <laughs> How can you explain? You can explain. Where do you have a choice to stop the suffering on the spin of the samsara wheel? Is First, by learning the steps in dependent origination, then looking 
at the contact and with contact as condition, feeling arises and with feeling as condition, craving arises, which starts the power moving, push energy, then with craving as condition, clinging arises and it starts to go faster, mental proliferation, run, 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 story, story, story. Then with mental proliferation, the human being is pushed to, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? <laughs> and inside, mind is saying, I'll take care of it, I'll take care of it, we'll go to the library, and pulls out a card and says, I got it, it's this one. And then there's birth of reaction. And then the consequence. And this birth of reaction, of course, runs into another circle and another circle and another circle. But if it was a reaction that happened again and again, it's, we can pretty safely say it's coming from past experience. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Yeah? So where do you have the choices to stop the flow of this surge of anger? Okay. So let's go back. You have contact and a painful feeling arises. I don't like it. Yeah? You can, it's a nice idea to say, well, I can get rid of the bottoms part and that part won't happen. But let me show you something. What is actually happening when you start to heal? When you start to change, here, here is what's happening, okay? Let's go here. Contact, feeling. Craving, clinging, habitual tendency, birth of reaction. And then the aging and death and sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. All right. Now what's happening here is when contact happens, if you get into the feeling, here's the painful feeling. If you can detect that, okay, then you feel the push forward with craving, I don't like it. See the personal part here, the personal part, I don't like it. I'm sorry, yeah, craving, well, here we go. And then the story, right, story, story. Then habitual tendency, you got to pick a card and decide what you're going to do. And it happens very quickly because it's reactive. And then it pops. This is where it just kind of bang. It explodes. It's like a hand grenade right there. There's your hand grenade. And it just explodes. And then the consequence of it is over here. Now, the thing about Buddhism is it shows you where the choices are. But in order to heal, it, it appears, it turns out to be with probably over 50 or 60 people that I've checked so far, if they use this to heal themselves, the first thing that they cancel out it's not at the left side, it's at the right side. So they stop here, they stop. They don't hit back. 
and then, then they walk away. They six R and they walk away, but they do not, they stop. They don't react. They stop and say, I will not yell back anymore. This is just fruitless. Doesn't go anywhere, doesn't accomplish anything. I'm not gonna ever yell back anymore. And then they realize, they realize this one. They realize that the library is real. And so then what they do is they close the library. They put a lock on the library. They put a lock on it. And they are not gonna open this. They make a decision. Every time that person does that, I do this. I'm not gonna do it anymore that way. Then they experience it maybe again. And what happens is they step back to the clinging and they, they realize they really do stop the story. So this is like, this is like, we're going to stop the story. And now what they've done is they've canceled this one, they've canceled this one, and they canceled this one. Now all they're left with is, I don't like this. And they can feel this is pulling and they can attempt to do this. They're not going to, I'm going to tell you the truth, they're not going to get rid of this until they're an Arahat. Nobody does. But can they cut it down? Can they cut it way, way down? And then they realize as they're reducing this, as they're reducing this, they come to realize there are choices they're making. They chose to stop. This was a choice. They they chose to close the library. There's another choice. They closed the down the storybook. They stopped it. You see? And when they make this choice, this is something that they never knew in their life before. They had a choice. They had accepted this was a Buddhist, and that's not good, right? So they're back to craving. And now what happens is when they stop this birth of reaction, what are they encouraged to do here? When they stop this they to there, see? <laughs> and what they're encouraged to do is to respond, respond. And this is why the Buddha talks about changing reaction to response. This is what has he given us? Oh my gosh, he has given us a way to cancel that. And he has shown us there is, there is, a door. There's a door. And there's peace over here. Peace. There's peace. If they just go through the door by this response. How many times do you have to do this before it changes and you just stop, you just get tired, you get bored of the story, you get bored of the clinging, cling, 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 cling. The story going, that, 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 don't you remember? That, 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 that. And all this stuff in your head. So you, you get bored and you let go. So what he's done is he says, there is a choice that you can make. We call this volition. In Buddhism, we call it volition, okay? And this is called, whoops, that's not wit, that's not right. Whoops, ah, I did it again. Your screen is sharing, You're, you are sh screen sharing. 
Okay, good. I'm happy I'm screen sharing. I don't know why I did that. That's all right. <laughs> I didn't know a lot about what's happening today. Okay, so here uh, we can do it with um, what shall we use? Here we go. Um, we call this volition. It's why, why are you not letting me write? Oh, you want, I don't know how to cancel that. Okay. Okay. Volition is what we do, we call it in, in Buddhism. And volition means choice or choice of will, choice of leaning in that direction, you see? So by choosing, where can we choose? We can choose not to walk into the argument and not only not to walk into it, but to turn it around. So you need to start laughing. This is where humor is so important. How do we know that you are actually, how do we know, how do I get back to all of you? I can never do this, this is really awful. I can never do it. Um, all right. Nope, I can't do that either. <laughs> this is so funny. I don't know how to do it. And someday I'm going to try to figure it out. <laughs> Help! <laughs> I don't know what to do. Okay. <laughs> Volition is the biggest gift that you're given in Buddhism. You are given this choice. You're not only told again and again, how um, all of this works. You're also given a way out. You know, in other countries, I'm dealing with monks that are in temples and they're attempting to teach classes and they're doing this. I come into India and I'm running into beggars on the street. Um, you know, or I'm running into people who are not attached to, to um, anything and just roaming around. And, and they're giving tiny little stories or poetry or things. And this is part of the prophecies. This is part of the dilution of the Dhamma. This was all predicated, the Buddha said, was going to happen. He said, you would walk in one day, you would walk into a city and you would see no monks and you would see people standing on the corner with a string around their neck with a little piece of orange cloth inside a glass container and that's all that's left of the robes. And you would see a, a monk, before that you would see a monk standing there in the robes with a money bag around his neck. And there would be no bowls anymore and there uh, would not be doing the alms. It'd probably be very difficult to safely do the alms in India. It would be because it isn't, it isn't part of the culture unless you're in an area where it's happening, where there's a group of monks in the forest and supporters, but it would all be in a closed system. It's not normal, but in Sri Lanka, you can still go there. And if you're in your robes, I could go from the, from the university a couple streets over if I wanted to with my bowl and get lunch by walking down the street and come back and eat it in my office. I could do that when I was at the state university office. And so different countries are in different situations about this. Birth link is where it, the final action goes out of you, but you have a choice. You have a choice. If you stop that and you know how, the only way you can stop it is by learning how human cognition works. And how you get to that point, if you, if you are not taught the pieces, you can never let go, okay? The retreat itself, the concept of the retreat, is one thing we're bringing to you in a totally different way. Um, the retreat has turned into, internationally has basically turned into for many more people than actually use it the right way. There are those people who use it to escape the world, go into a bubble, go to a retreat, and then leave the bubble and go back into life and try to survive the way they did before. Nothing changes in life. 
That's not what the retreat was about. It was only meant to be a way to help you have a play to retreat from the disturbances of life for the purpose of growing your skills. So eventually you could take it back into life and activate the skills to calm down the situation and change it so that you could live a more peaceful life. We all know that this is a gradual teaching, a gradual practice and a gradual progress. That's in 107 at 107.3. What's happening there, it's, he teaches the, he says to um, Mogulana that, um, he tells Ganika Mogulana, he tells him, progress down to the last step of the staircase. That's how he puts it. And you see that conversation, he also directs them, person that he's talking to, to go to 65, suit to number 65, section 33. And that's a wonderful, description at 65, um, 33, a great description of exactly how you train a baby horse, you know, a colt or a filly that's born, the colt, the, um, and take the colt from the beginning. He has, he's uh, the clever horse trainer obtains a fine thoroughbred colt. He first makes him get used to wearing a bit in his mouth. While the colt is being made to get used to wearing the bit, because he's doing something that he's never done before, he displays some contortions, writhing, moving his body and vacillation going this way, going that way with his head. But through constant repetition and gradual practice, he becomes peaceful in that action of wearing the bit in his mouth. The colt has become peaceful in that action and the horse trainer further makes him get used to wearing a harness on his back. The cult responds in the same way to wearing the harness because he's doing something he's never done before and displays the same type of contortion, writhing and vacillation, bucking and everything else. But through constant repetition and gradual practice, he becomes peaceful in that action. Doesn't this sound like the way that we're teaching you? Doesn't this sound like the step-by-step -step process? You see? When the cult has peaceful in that action, he then takes him and teaches him to keep in step. And then in running in a circle, and then he teaches him prancing and being in the highest speed in gentleness, he trains the horse but step by step. And at each point, he, he's doing something he never did before. He displays the same contortion, right, writhing and vacillation. He then gates the horse until the horse is a fine thoroughbred cold possessed with the ten factors and is worthy of a king and a king's service. And he teaches Bharati, he says, worthy of okay, when a monk penalty worthy of merit for the world. And what are those ten qualities? 
the right view of one beyond training, the right intention of one beyond training, the right speech and the right action and the right livelihood beyond training and the right effort beyond training, the right mindfulness of one beyond training and the right concentration or collectedness of mind for one beyond training and the right knowledge of one beyond training and the right deliverance of one beyond training. When they have these 10 qualities, he is worthy of gifts and worthy of hospitality and worthy of offerings, worthy of reverent, reverential salutation. And he becomes an unsurpassed field of merit for the world. So the Buddha lays it all out. He doesn't keep anything from you. In, it comes down to what is it in Buddhism that people will keep it functioning and alive the rest of this century. I can't speak for beyond that, but... <laughs> What can keep it going right now is using it. It was never meant to be a, just a ceremony of visit and leaving. It was something that was meant for you to use and to share and to pass around. I think one time, you know, if you write me and tell me, I think one time, we should do uh, something about how to introduce it to people who are not Buddhist, how to use it in the world, in a non-Buddhist world. I'm, I'm in my life right now looking at what's happening in the world. And as human beings, I know it feels good to be in a group. It feels good to have a bunch of people around and have that as a support structure. It's always nice. I just wish at some point in the whole world, people would say how many people were in the world and they would give us a census of human beings and there was no other labels because the labels are killing us. In the United States, they're tearing our country apart. And I think in other countries, the labels are there and that's what causes the friction. Human beings, we've gone to another level in the development of mankind. We've gone to a level where pretty soon it'll be right in our faces, every one of us. We cannot afford to be me and you. We have to be we in relationship to our survival on the planet. It's becoming pretty obvious that the question of a continued existence for all of us as humanity comes down to, can we understand there we're never supposed to be any this or that, just the human being. And then it thinks would work a lot better. So that's about all I have to say about birth. Um, once the birth happens, you enter into the last link of aging and death. And that aging and death is sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. We'll talk about it briefly at some point. Not, I know we have a couple things we need to do before we do that, but we will we'll get to it. But the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair is not something that has to happen all the time. We need to really look at Buddhism closely. The moment we say that everything, all of life is sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, it happens only because we have not sorted out the definitions correctly as what this really was hap that was happening. He found a gift. The Buddha found the cessation of suffering and he found something for all of you. End of story. Anybody have questions? I know somebody has questions out there. <laughs> there must be a question somewhere.
Yes, I have a question. I always have a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you spoke a lot about volition um, on, uh, well, I would say it was not the whole talk, but yes. Um, earlier in the, in, the, in the talk, you asked us for the five aggregates and one of them is volition. And I was wanted to know, I wanted to know if that is connected also to the volition as choice, as you mentioned it later in the 12. No, uh, no, no, one of them is not volition. It's body, then feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness are your five aggregates. Body, from your head to your toes. Feeling, pleasant, painful, or neutral. Perception, which names things in the process of your experience. It's the part of your brain that names things. Thoughts that arise from your mind, your brain produces thoughts. And consciousness, which gives you the ability to cognize or understand what is happening as it happens, as it occurs, yeah? See, we, you know, in Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, he likes the word volitional. And um, he does. <laughs> I used to have a lot of trouble with that. You know, there, of course, there's a discussion that goes on in that. How do you say, um, let's see, how is it? Um, with ignorance as condition, uh, con uh, formations arise. But he'll say volitional formations arise. Now, this is the problem with this word. This is one of these word games. In an English dictionary, if we look up volitional, I'm not sure if I can, let me see if I can do it here. You do it on your phone if you want to. Volitional. Um, volitional means choice. And um, it means... In the vast sense in Buddhism, volition has to do with to crave and cling or not to crave and cling. That is the Buddhist question. <laughs> to be or not to be, um, and that was, that was Shakespeare's to be or not to be. If we took his be and we turned his be into relax, reaction, with you look at his plays, I would say that there's a lot of reaction happening in, in, in Shakespeare. So you would say, to be or not to be, that is the question. Let's try to react or not to react. That is the question. Now look at his plays. So maybe he meant that too. Who knows? You know, we're not sure. And, and people say that he was influenced by Buddhism, whoever he was. We have that problem too. But you go to volition, let me see if it's here. I think I have, you, you have choice. Oh gosh, I don't think it's here. No, that's why I hate the, the um, do you have your phone? Because I don't know what I did with my phone at this point. Um, oh, wait a second, I heard it. Okay, I hear it's here. If we look it up, um, this is the argument many professors have at this time. We cannot actually teach Buddhism by using English dictionaries. We need someone to spend five years and develop a dictionary in English that adequately explains what is meant in certain terms, you see? Because if you were to look up meditation in the newest dictionaries today, the, the force and money behind the mindfulness movement has turned the word into meditation as only meaning severe concentration on one particular thing, just one thing. So we have this bowl and we just watch it and that's it. You see this one point of concentration, but that's not what was in the big dictionary. You know, the one I mean, the big one in the back of the library, the big one, if you go in there and you look up uh, the um, meditation, you get a different idea. So that's uh, the power of things. Uh, I want to look up volition. I used to, let me try to do this for you. And mm -hmm. mm. Mm. 
here we go, define volition. No, this is not working. <laughs> we have to go back here again. Um, the first definition that popped into my phone was the faculty or power of using one's will. Yeah, one's will. Now the question is, when you go from ignorance to formations, who is there and what's, what does will have to do with anything? Who is making that? Because there, those are potential links uh, that um, formations initially and um, consciousness. And th they're preparatory links for the operation of human cognition. So how do you use a word to explain what he means by volition. I keep meaning, I, I keep wanting to write him a letter and I never quite get to it, but I'm gonna have in to the, do it. In the Miriam Webster, it has a second definition that says uh, an act of making a choice or decision. There you go. That's where you have volition in other places in, throughout the text. You find, you have the volition, um, the decision to make or not make a choice and so choice it's it's in line with free will in christianity and they don't like me to say that but that's the truth in christianity you have the decision to live by the commandments or not live by the commandments to make a choice or not make a choice to end up in sin or to stay free of sin you see in in the christian system so i don't see anything wrong with it because in the buddhist system you have volition to crave or not to crave. And if you don't crave, you won't cling. Now, when you say um, there's places in the text that talk about the aggregates and they'll say um, aggregates affected by clinging, but it doesn't say when affected by clinging or if affected by clinging get it so when you find these this in the text you have to figure out when did the sutta happen if you can from the clues of who is in the sutta where are they what's going on where was he in his teaching exactly what's going on um the thing is if you're talking to people in the sutta who are already have already learned the practice and are, are using it all the time. They know that um, they have a choice to uh, crave and cling or not to crave and cling, you see? They know, they, they're learning about that because they're learning about dependent origination. This is where the texts text get interesting because when I was teaching dependent origination a number of years ago somebody approached me and said you know it's not really a clear teaching at all and i said what do you mean and they said well you know in one place he talks with five links another place nine another place 11. another place um there's more links you see that's true but if he only needs five links to solve an issue that is the topic of a sutta, he's only going to use five links. If he needs seven or nine, or uh, if he wants to use 23, he teaches you transcendental dependent origination. He teaches you that. And so where is that? Okay, that's on page 553 of the Samyutta Nikaya. If you go into... Samyutta Nikaya, um, you find proximate cause on page 553. At the bottom of that page, there's a sutta. It's, it's like 23, okay, dot, or, I'm sorry, 23, and then in parentheses, 23. I'm sorry, 23 parentheses, three unparentheses. That's how you do it. And it's called proximate cause. And what that is, is the Upanisa Sutta. And it has 23 links instead of 12 links. 
And why is that happening? Because when you teach the Upanisha Sutta, you are showing the knowledge of the way the suffering is happening in human cognition. And you are also then following that with the way out of the suffering through the development of your practice from the very beginning until you reach Nibbana. That's what's in that, um, in that. So if you took a picture of the chart that I made and it was the half moon shaped chart with all the lines on it. If you go back to that and look at the picture of it, one of those lines is the transcendental dependent origination. It's the Upanisha Sutta. It starts out with um, suffering and then faith. And then you start to practice. The monk tells you how to practice. You start to practice. And then the first thing that happens is you uh, find relief, pamoja. And then after you experience some relief, you continue to practice and you experience joy, uplifted joy, PT. When the PT fades away, you experience what you always experience. You always experience pasadi, tranquility, internal tranquility, different than you've ever experienced before. So the joy fades and the tranquility is what's left. When the tranquility fades, sukha arises. So the pasadi fades and sukha arises is a, an internal contentment. That's what Buddhist happiness is. Yeah. And then it's a steady, balanced kind of ongoing thing. And the sukha continues. So now your confidence, you go back and you sit again because your collectedness is balanced. That's a collectedness. And then what happens is when you practice that time, you get it. You see, you, you, understand um how does it say uh, knowledge uh knowledge and vision of how things actually work you not i can never remember it in poly that one and then when you go past that one you continue because you're so interested in this and you're really getting deeper and seeing how it's working inside and that's when you hit disenchantment and disenchantment is nibida, nibida. Okay. And when the nibida passes away, you're in the deepest states. Now you're sitting two, three hours, two, three, four hours, and then you're getting into experience of uh, dispassion. And that happens, it's just dispassion is just nothing is disturbing you, and there's no urgency for anything, and you're going toward the cessation to prepare your, balance your um, enlightenment factors and fall into the cessation uh, will come as you pass through, uh, uh, as you come through the other side of the neither perception or non-perception, you'll just turn off. And when you turn off, it's very slight, very short, but it's a stop. It is not just a blackout. It is different. And it's different because, you know, when you, when you just have a blackout, when you just come on, there's light. It's different than this. There's no change in anything. But there's something that changes in you that we talk about when you come out of this because there are some changes in the sense doors and the body that you, you want to talk about. So we listen to you talk about what happened. And that's what's fascinating about this. And then you go back and sit again. <laughs> and the you, teacher, you know, you just whoo, and you have more energy when you come out than you have usually. And um, sometimes people will just say, I can't go back and sit. I just have to walk, walk, walk. So they say, go take a hike. And, you know, they'll go nine, 10 miles, you know, or um, they might ride a bike 15, 20 miles and come back 15 or 20 miles. And then they're not tired. They sleep like a baby, very much better than they did before. And they wake up easily without being grumpy. 
and this goes on for a while, and then they keep practicing, it will happen again. And different levels happen in the attainments as you advance on. Okay? Anybody else have a question? Yeah? Deepa? You have to turn your mic. Can you no. hear me now? Yes, yes, now I can, yeah. Yes, okay. Um, so the question was, um, you said that once we, we stop at the, the birth and then we keep shutting down everything before, uh, but craving continues until the end. We, we keep having craving until the end. And so, so the question I had... It gets tiny, 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 tiny. It's a fractional thing, but it's not completely gone until you're in Arahat, you know? Okay. Not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the question. Like, does the nature of craving change as you progress in your practice? Mm -hmm. Yes, and definitely. Yeah, um, you, you. Um, it's a diminishing process. If you can, if you are consistent with practicing, it is a diminishing process down to the last step of the staircase. Just the way he talks about it. Okay, you just keep going, yeah? And it's, things don't bother you and it's like learning to be a duck. <laughs> Water just rolls off your back <laughs> and it doesn't soak you. I mean, ducks do take showers and baths, they like that. They like to be sprayed with the hose and you know, it's just like parrots like to have mist baths, they like that. Um, but they don't get wet the way we do. It's different. You know, they don't get sopped. <laughs> yeah. And eventually, you know, that's, that's gone. It's not an issue. Uh, the person is living more and more and more in the present time, moving along in the present time without going here or going here, moving along in the present time is comfortable. That's what makes life easier and gives you the ability to figure out how to deal with whatever happens in life. That's how it works. Yeah? Okay. Anybody else? Wow, I'm early, huh, Dhamma Gavesia, Bhanti Dhamma Gavesia, I'm, I'm early. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Do you want to close this uh, sharing of the uh, file? Does anybody have any questions for me before I go down there to um, Ulasagar? You can still write me. I'll figure out a way to answer you if you want to write me. Um, but what happens is I move down there and try to figure out how to stay away from people in the middle of the city. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I have to finish putting the place together. And if anybody, you know, um, I've had people at did. Um, if anybody wants to do donations, they should just call Bhante Dhamma Gavesi and ask him because I'm not sure exactly what we're doing with that right now. I know no, we're trying uh, to get hmm. you know, set up. Yeah. So currently, what is happening is that. Uh, 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 Pratik uh, has some uh, questions about the tax liability. So he said that he is not going to do that. The other person who was going to help is has COVID and he is in hospital. So he is not there. So for the time being, we, ca uh, we can put it in. Uh, I have an account for the Paytm, which is uh, what uh, Sister Kema is uh, kind of uh, handling that account. So that is uh, money is there with uh, whatever is money is there is for the uh, Sangha expenses for yeah. there in uh, uh, Paytm. So I can give that Paytm account. Uh, yeah, you can give that. You, what was, I don't know, what was the limit on how much we can put in there? I can't remember. I think uh, safely we should put about uh, in the total in a year from uh, say, I think uh, less than five lakhs. Oh, okay. In a year, financial year. 
The only thing, I think the only thing that really goes in there right now is there's a, there's one person that gives us 10,000 rupees once a month. That's one. Yeah, but uh, whatever we had, uh, Pratik had uh, 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 received also has been put across. So about 250,000 we have maybe received in my accounts. Okay. So maybe we, we will have an uh, access to say next uh, October, November, December, January, February, March. It will be in, in the next six months about two lakhs, two lakhs fifty thousand amount in that amount can be but received. What we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, we have to get serious about setting up an association very quickly because Correct. when I go into Mumbai, there's a lot of plans, and I'm not going to stay there unless this gets ironed out. It has to it has to move this time, you know. Um, meaning it has to be progressive. And the place I'm staying at will be okay this time. I know I feel safely that I won't be getting ex totally exhausted and wiped out and dead again. Because <laughs> I had to run away to, to South Korea once for six weeks just to get better when I had very bad conditions, you know, as far as, as living was concerned. And the Just water, the yeah, the water filters were not being cleaned where I was staying, and the food was very poor. And and then I did the best I could, but it was forty six degrees centigrade without air conditioning, and I couldn't deal with it. So that's one hundred and nineteen degrees Fahrenheit for anybody who doesn't know centigrade. <laughs> and um, I lasted two weeks in that environment. And then uh, we had an air conditioner in one room that was mostly broken, but it, it made it so you could sleep. But the problem is, as a nun, I cannot stay in, the, in a vihara. I'm not supposed to stay where the monks are staying. And uh, they made it a little difficult because I had enough uh, saved up that I could probably have built a place, but it wasn't permitted to do that on the land that the temple was on. So it didn't happen. So that's just what's going on. We just do what we can do as we go along. And um, we have to, um, several things that we have to still do in this little place. We have to put the, get a geezer and put the geezer in. For the hot water, we have to um, have the water purification system and have that put into the kitchen. So there's fresh water system. The AC has been put in. Uh, whether we act, I don't know how we're going to actually teach people there, but we might be able to have three or four people come to meet there not now. now. Maybe in uh... no, no, not now, but eventually we can have two or three people come there to meet. But that room was originally built to take fifteen or twenty people sitting in that room, you know, next to each other in meditation. But that can't happen now that we've had COVID. Everything's changed. So we do what we can with this, and we also know that there are some uh, vacant buildings that might be able to be taken and refurbished and, and turned into something. So people are saying they're going to talk about it when I get down there. We'll see what they say, but it has to come from India, and India has to want it. It can't come from us because we don't have the funds to do it from Damasuka. But we get supported when we do our tours a lot of that money comes in it came in and it's the reason that we could survive in goa was because the money from the retreats is what made it so we could support ourselves for six months in goa so it was <laughs> you know we had a free three month period and then three or three and a half months where we had to pay our own way to do it so and it was exciting. It was interesting for a Buddhist nun to settle, sit down in a huge Portuguese Catholic community. <laughs> and people were very good to me, very good in Goa. And it's a really good place. Um, I, I just wish that they could, uh, uh, they let people in now to Goa, but I wish that um, they could get their caseload lower because now that people are coming in the caseload goes up and the hospitals get full and it doesn't seem to clear up so um uh, it eventually everything will settle down that's the way it is because why 
Anicca. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anybody else? Is there anything else you need to tell them? Yes. I, I want to uh, once again remind them that uh, on uh, uh, Saturday, this coming Saturday, we will have the yoga session uh, by uh, Hugh and uh, Sarah. So this is a session we uh, uh, had previously once uh, we had a session and it will be at seven, uh, one, half an hour after our normal time. And uh, this uh, session, uh, uh, there is a previous uh, recording of the session also, which I have shared in WhatsApp. I'll just sh share it with you now also. So uh, uh, please make sure that uh, you uh, come uh, and attend this session because there is a lot of people who found uh, that uh, when they did this uh, uh, Shakti, uh, sorry, Sukhita Yoga, they found uh, it to be uh, useful because they are using the principles of uh, relaxation, that is swim principles, and they are using it in uh, yoga. So that they are blending it in. So it is a kind of, a, if you are already doing uh, uh, meditation, you're already doing swim, then this is kind of an additional thing. And uh, in retreats, uh, many people found it to be kind of helpful. Yeah, uh, the, the original thing that happened with this was um, a friend, one of our students from a long time ago, she was doing yoga in Portland, Oregon. And she touched on this at that time. We realized that when you're doing a set of yoga, with say six different positions for one set, okay? And you're gonna do the set maybe two times or three times, however you do it, when you strike the position, when you take the position, then if you, you process in your mind to let go of all thoughts and to um, uh, relax your brain, relax your head, that your body will, when you let go of a thought as you're doing this, you, you see the thought coming in and you release it, then you relax your head and when, you relax, you drop. And what was happening to her, she was very good at yoga. She was dropping sometimes as deeply as two inches more into a, a position or three inches deeper into it. And she became fantastic. She, she really, really became good with this. Um, and so she passed away. Now she's not with us anymore. But to see what happened just by using the six set, these six steps, uh, involved with this in agreement with the yoga, okay? So the actual thing she's doing is the yoga and the position of the body, but she is doing the steps and the relaxed step is letting her settle into the position. And then she takes, you know, a, a few breaths and then comes out. So it, it makes a much more advanced student in the positioning when you're doing your sets. Beautiful. So looking forward to that with uh, Sarah and um, with you. And also look ahead because we're going to have some classes for teachers to come in and have an open room to do some, find out what the teachers, where the teachers want help and talk a little bit about that. And we're going to have a sharing of that. Also, there is the index that's been developed and the index I shared with um, uh, Dr. Major and he said he'd help us if we wanted to do some like a few weekends two or three weekends he would translate and we would talk about this index and then eventually we can get the index into hindi and the index is covering uh 76 suttas in the majima nikaya that we use for the information of what we're teaching and the 22 of those suttas in those 76 that are being used in the as the resource for the retreats. And also, um, it gives you a lot, lot of notes that were on my old book that have the lead you to the subjects and where to go and find the different subjects. It's like a topical index that was included with that. And it also gives you Bonte's original reading list the way that he set up a reading list a uh, long time ago. And it also, um, that's broken down in general talks, beginners talks and advanced talks. 
So you kind of know which ones to stay away from for the first year you're developing your practice to stay away from them and to, and to stay with the beginner uh, suttas and look at the general suttas and not get involved in the more advanced ones until later. It's better that way. Uh, uh, just to clarify, we will have the next session with you on 17th of October. After 10 and days. that one will be in pursuit mm -hmm. of happiness. Or whatever I said. <laughs> ah, I, I put the announcement uh, now uh, after uh, this. Uh, okay. I, I'll uh, announce uh, that, uh, or maybe I can wait till uh, use is uh, session is over. Then I can put it across uh, okay. for the next session uh, on tenth October. I'll uh, announce that. Okay. And that's okay. that's about everything. I can't. Think okay. Of then uh, we'll. Uh, Share the merits. Mm -hmm. May suffering this ones be suffering, suffering free, free and, and the fearless fearless be. May the grieving may be and all should be. And may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that, that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all, of all kinds of happiness. May being inhabiting space in a devas and malas mighty power share this merit of our Buddhist dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.